evening session, it is with great pleasure that I invite Dr. Hwang Hee Cho, the President of Science and Technology Policy Institute, onto the stage to deliver his welcoming remarks. Please give him a big round of applause. Hi, everybody. Uh, Professor Mustafa, President of Future University of Sudan, uh, Dr. Hong Juhan, Deputy Secretary of UNSCARP, uh, Dr. Sumet, State Minister of Ethiopia, Dr. Dong Ju Che, Professor of Sungmyung Women's University, Mr. Jonathan Wong, Chief of UNSCARP, and uh, uh, distinguished guests and speakers and discount, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my warmest welcome to all of you here participate in the 2018 Steppe International Symposium titled The Role of Korea in the Global Development Corporation, Science, Technology, and Innovation. I also would like to acknowledge the general support from our government, the Ministry of Science and ICT, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Since the United Nations has initiated sustainable development goals in 2015, the global community has started recognizing the role of science, technology, and innovation as a key instrument for addressing development challenges such as climate change, industrialization, inclusive growth, and sustainable energy. In this new framework of SDGs, the Korean government has designated the contribution on UN SDGs as a goal of the second master plan of international cooperation development in 2016. For this, the Korean government has tried to increase the volume of ODA, the strengths and partners with the, the private sector, and promote cooperation with international communities. At the same time, the demand for cooperation with Korea from partner countries has has been on the rise because of its unique developed history. Korea has accomplished dra dramatic industrialization and uh, remarkable economic growth on the basis of sustainable progress in science and technology. To promote ASEAN development, the Korean government has planned and implemented various policy measures, which indeed has a positive impact on advanced STI and was able to successfully incorporate STI into industrialization. STEPI, as a global think tank for STI policy research, has been actively participating in various international cooperation programs in the field of science, technology, and innovation over the last decade. At first, STEP has, has been involved in the capacity development programs launched by the Korean government since the late 1990s. To cooperate with partner countries more effectively, STEP established the International Innovation Cooperation Center in January 2014. Based on IICC, STEP has tried to build a sustainable platform for STI cooperation by communicating with customers closely connecting diverse innovative actors strongly and uh, addressing global development challenges directly. In 2018, we are operating six policy consulting programs and two training programs for eight partner countries from Asia and Africa. Next year, STEPI plans to extend the cooperation programs to work with more partner countries under the support from our Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well as Ministry of Science and ICT. Korea has also experienced a bunch of trial and errors in the process of economic development. Not every country has achieved the desired economic and social development based on STI. Still, I am pretty sure that our experience can be a good reference to our partners who have the same desire we had before. The experience provides the knowledge and the know-how on what we should do facilitated the economic development and how to utilize STI capacity as a driver of industrialization. I hope this conference will be another cornerstone for building relationships among experts as well as a platform for circulating knowledge 
and the info information regarding STI and the development. I'm sure that this conference will contribute to taking our effort to the next level and enhancing cooperation among partners. Now, I would like to officially announce the opening of the 2018 STEPI International Symposium is the theme of the role of Korea in the global development cooperation, science, technology, and innovation. Let the brainstorming get to know each other, exchange ideas, and shake hands. Please enjoy keynote speech, presentations, and discussions. We have a pretty report today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cho. Uh, before we go on to keynote speech, I would just like to say thank you for thank you to Ms. Myungja Kim, the president of the Korea Federation of Science and Technology Societies, and the former Minister of Environment for attending our symposium. Thank you. <laughs> we will now yield the floor to Dr. El Tayef Mustafa, the president of the Future University of Sudan, who will deliver a keynote speech. He will speak about the role of international cooperation. Please give a warm round of applause. Have to show me how this works. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to to be here, and thankful to Steppy, President Cho, and my younger brother, Duke Sun Yim, <laughs> who made who made sure that I. I uh, have the honor of being invited to this important symposium. So I will, uh, from my profile, you have learned that I've been all my life in UNESCO. I grew up from baby to grand old man in UNESCO. And therefore, I'm biased to that organization. Hopefully, I'll be trying to cover the beginning of international cooperation, its present, and some ideas about the future of international cooperation in science, technology, and innovation. And I will start by a brief history. I submit that, like in the area of science policy, this letter of President Roosevelt that he sent to his science advisor at that time, Venivar Bush, he asked him four questions. Here we are interested in the first question. And the first question was, How, what can be done to make known to the world as soon as possible the contribution we have made during our war time effort to scientific knowledge? Here a president, in the highest of his might, having discovered the key to the atomic bomb, having discovered a lot of cures for diseases like malaria, yellow fever, and the, all the diseases he expected his army to face in, in Europe, he is willing to share all this knowledge, not with his allies, no, with the whole world. And not until the war is ended, no, as soon as possible. I think that was the beginning of international cooperation in science and technology. Now, Vannevar Bush took four years to answer the four questions his president gave him. A year per question, so to speak. And he issued in 1945 his famous report, Science, the Endless Frontier. We all, the community of science policy, think that this is the beginning of science policy as we know it today. Now, in the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, in London, 28 member states met to see how can we prevent such a terrible war from happening again. And their analysis were, it is the, you know, ignorance of each other's cultures and way of life and are at the origin of this. And that they need to sort of think about changing mindsets. So their vision was, since war begins in the minds of men, then it is in the minds of men that the defense of peace must be constructed. This is the fairest preamble of UNESCO constitution. So they decided to create an organization to 
promote international cooperation on education and culture. They forgot science. So the scientific community of the United Kingdom, led by this man called Julian Huxley, a prominent biologist, and others like Alexander King, who became later the secretary of OECD, and uh, uh, Mr. Needham, Joseph Needham, the giant who wrote that monumental work on China, science, and civilization. So they thought that on the contrary, because science was misused, this atomic bomb that made so much destruction was from science, that science should be used to improve the welfare of the world. And so the UNESCO became UNESCO. So they added the S so that the organization can promote understanding and collaboration in education, science, and culture. So much so that UNESCO was born, and this man, Julian Huxley, became the first director general, amazingly. And Needham became the second man in charge of science and technology. He is the first assistant director general for science. So the scientific community not only won that scientific international cooperation in science is important, but they took over UNESCO completely. So this is uh, what happened in, uh, in the, uh, unfortunately, my, I cannot see from this angle uh, my slides. Uh, maybe can I do this one? Now, uh, on the other side, we had a man called Alexander King. Now, Alexander King was fighting a war in his own country, convincing his government no, I don't think I can do it from here. Uh, convincing his government to set up the fairest council for science policy. And he thought that the role of this council will be to show how science and technology can help in the post-war effort of reconstruction and how that innovation coming from the, the scientific discovery can promote economic growth. So the link between science and technology and economic growth was already in the minds of uh, Alexander King at that time, but not in his uh, colleagues. As you remember, before the OECD, the name was OEC. It was Organization for European Economic Cooperation. And it was created to deploy the Marshall Plan. Now, the member state of that organization did not believe that there is any link between science, and they were there, and all the effort to convince them to do it, they did not. They believed that science policy is part of educational policy, and therefore should be left for UNESCO. This has nothing to do with OEC, which became later OECD. So you can see that UNESCO immediately implemented its first big project. This is CERN. Now I think Koreans are very much involved in this magnificent project, were 11,000 scientists from 100 countries. In 1951, at UNESCO headquarters, they laid the foundation for this magnificent accelerator, uh, so to speak, uh, trying to crack the, the matter and use nuclear energy, nuclear physics for peaceful purposes. Now, this is the 27 kilometers tunnel accelerator between France and Switzerland. But it's best known for the first, this man called Tim Bernanke, he's the inventor of the today's internet. In fact, his problem was how can this quantity of scientists from all the globe, how can they exchange their, their documents? I mean, I want to send my document to, to Professor Chu, I, I want to send the document, how can I do it? And he created this hypertext transfer protocol, which is HTTP, and he, the first, person to you with this protocol on the world wide web. So the, the, this international cooperation in science already started giving birth. Now, the British and American delegates at this organization, OEC, convened their colleagues to set up a committee or a, a science policy group, but they really were not very effective. They had to have some shock, and that shock came from the Sputnik. Now, the Sputnik, sent by the Russian in 1957, 
made panic in the United States of America. Uh, to that extent that people, ordinary people, were scared to death that their enemy of always is gonna come from the space to conquer them. And all the movies you have seen were originated from this imaginary effort. But this Sputnik led the people in OAC to believe in the use of science and, and technology policy, and then the OEC has been transformed into OECD by adding not only European countries, but other countries, uh, and I think Korea joined it in 1997. So here is the base of the second organization. UNESCO from one side, OECD from two, second side, two organizations that are involved in science. UNESCO in this period started beautiful programs, general problems of scientific research, and I don't want to, to read all of them, but UNESCO went into putting the foundation for international cooperation in science and technology, making survey of, of all the inquiries of uh, natural sciences, and so on and so forth. So UNESCO went into uh, uh, helping people understand the use of science. In the 60s have witnessed an incredible interest in science and technology policy. Well, you have to imagine that this period, many countries became independent, not only in Africa, in Arab states, in Latin America, and in Asia. So, they were interested in science. In 1962, UNESCO for the first time included in its program something about science policy, which is information about science policy uh, and exchange about, uh, of information about science policy. Uh, so, now, in 1963, United Nations, together with UNESCO's assistant, organized the first international conference on science and technology and innovation for the least developed countries. Now, it is a specialized conference uh, that took place in Geneva uh, in 1993. But uh, the, in 1964, UNESCO invited its member states, just following that conference, to start uh, elaborating their national science and technology uh, policy. And uh, I mean, the, the, the programs on science policy became formal and the creation of a division of science and technology policy, the famous STP division of UNESCO, headed by Mr. De Hempton, the Ferris Director General. And I had the honor of chairing this division from 1996 till I retired in 2009. Now, this division made a uh, history of science and technology in and, uh, on scientific research in UNESCO. Now, UNESCO extended assistance to, to many countries. I don't want to mention them, but these countries, the list goes, there are 46 documents uh, doc documenting this adventure of UNESCO, and the number of countries that were assisted were about 80 countries which have been assisted. Uh, the, uh, the second conference was organized in 1979. This time, not for the least developed countries. It was for the whole world. And it was about science and technology for development. It took place in Vienna in 1977. But for its elaboration, Alexander King of OECD suggested that we, we should organize regional conferences, and then the output of these conferences can go as an input to the international. So UNESCO took its, uh, the responsibility of organizing this called CAST system of conferences which is the conference of ministers of science and technology, Cast Africa, Cast Asia, Castalac, and all the like, so that the conference in 79 could be a conference inclusive of... Uh, so, from there on, all science, international cooperation of science policy laid on the two organizations, UNESCO and OECD. And they were convinced that the fundamental reason for, for this is that the needs and the priorities are, always exceed the amount of resources available for them, resources being financial and uh, human resources. And therefore, there is a need to give priorities and allocate resources for these priorities. And of course, this is what STI is about. And that there is a need for a national organization or body or a mechanism to help government take informed decision about, about this. And this is the case now almost in every single country of the world. Now, I, I, I think here, um, the, 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 I'm just repeating that the, the need 
for, for these bodies to, to help governments uh, uh, organize themselves in the area of, of science policy. Now, of course, from their own, UNESCO and OECD started giving all the, the guides, guidelines and uh, instructions and manuals. And uh, UNESCO started its uh, manual on statistics in 78. Of course, the OECD later on in 2002 came up with the Frascati, and before that, well, there is Oslo manual and Canberra manuals and all the literature that guide us today in Steppe and elsewhere were then uh, initiated. So these two institutions really, that's why I'm, I'm insisting on, on repeating that, because I really think they have done uh, a, wonder, a wonderful job. Now, that is the past and history. You know, so what about today? Uh, I think now uh, Mr. Cho in his introduction referred to the importance of the SDGs and the Agenda 2030, that all the UN has adopted and all countries have taken it Syria and Korea, one should applaud because they're really taking this business of SDG seriously. So with this, the, there was uh, an initiative, this uh, uh, facility uh, mechanism has a, an interagency uh, team that was charged with looking at the role of STI in achieving SDGs and what the system is doing about it so that it can be the background for a discussion on the use of STI for achieving sustainable development. So they have examined, they found out there are more than 1,600 1, activity or action across the UN system of 20 agencies. And this encompasses about 2,600 full-time equivalent uh, staff with, uh, you can see the amount of money, it's one billion regular budget, but 120 million of resources, i.e. loans, grants, and funding trust. These activities could be grouped into two categories, be exactly 50-50. The half of them were primarily STI activities. So that means the activity is basically an STI activity targeted to achieve one or two targets of the uh, uh, SDGs. And the second was STI is a, a secondary or a component of these uh, activities. So the, the, uh, the role of STI at the UN uh, is, is immense. The seven agencies are taking the bigger share. I list them all here. Of course, uh, uh, UNESCO is one of them. Uh, and then the, the second uh, agencies are uh, taking uh, also responsibilities of about. Uh, then we, we, we also, I think, have other, I just wanted to, to go quickly because uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have very little time, I guess, uh, um, the, we have to mention that it's not only the UN that is really uh, supporting this STI. I have taken here other, other agencies and other groupings. And let me start by the BRICS. This is a very strong group with a might contribution in, for STI. The figures are in front of you. First of all, the population, there's 42% of the population. These are the countries which are uh, uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, China, and South Africa. And their contribution to the global GDP is 18%, but 17% of global R&D is in these countries. So this group is doing a lot of collaboration across these representing three continents, Africa, Latin America, and Asia, but also among them and with other uh, countries. Uh, BRICS, now after the BRICS, I look at the South House uh, G77 country. This 132 countries plus China, they call it. Uh, uh, Korea was part of this grouping until 1997 uh, and uh, became with heart uh, with them until 2010, uh, uh, promoting a lot on, and, and still Korea is helping the D77 countries. Now these countries, as you can see, they spread all over the planet. They have summits of heads of state that 
talk about science from time to time, and they had ministerial conferences. And uh, in fact, one of the summits of 2005 uh, requested the creation of this institute now in Kuala Lumpur. This is called an International uh, Center for South South Cooperation in Science, Technology, and Innovation. And China also created one for the group called SISTRAS, and all done with support from, from UNESCO. And as I mentioned here, that uh, Korea has been very uh, uh, supportive through exchanging its experience with these countries. Now, ASEAN, and this is you know it better than I, there is a ministerial conference for science and technology that meet annually since 1980, and they're contributing to the collaboration among the countries of ASEAN, but also among others. Another grouping, uh, I think I, I, I need to mention, this is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. It's an incredible amount of countries, and they have two organizations, but for the collaboration on OSTI. One is the COMSTEC, which is the commission of, Ministerial Commission on Science and Technology based on Pakistan. And they have ISESCO, which is the equivalent of UNESCO to the, uh, for the Islamic world. They may be not very effective. Uh, there is a joke about Prime Minister Mahathir, who tried very much to wake up this organization, and, and he, he couldn't. So now when you talk to him about OIC, he says, Oh, I see. So it's sort of, <laughs> he's jokingly about the effectiveness of these organizations. There is one for the Arab state, and this is also an organization imitating UNESCO called Arab League Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, cooperation among the Arab state, but also between the Arab state and the other countries of the world. So STI, international cooperation, goes on globally, regionally, and across regions in different different groupings. Now, Mercosur is the Latin American uh, grouping for science and technology and so on. Now, I, I thought, you know, we cannot just keep talking about Africa, being myself from Africa, and I also now supported by my colleague from, from Ethiopia, so we are very powerful. We can talk about Africa. Now, Africa has always been interested in science, but talking about it more than doing it. And, and this goes back to the early 60s, since independence. I'm citing here President Kwame Nkrumah in the very summit of, of African leaders. And he's talking about that, about using science and technology to make the desert green and, you know, sort of doing marvelous things about science and technology. And Africa, at that time of the 60s, it is this Africa. Terrible misery, all over the places, diseases of all sorts, and underdeveloped uh, infrastructure. Uh, you can see this beautiful transportation system, very effective, colorful and nice, but I don't think it's very uh, uh, efficient. And this is the agriculture of that time. So you can imagine, so African countries started working on this business of science for many years. Look at this agriculture time. And they had several, several meetings. In fact, they, they had even summits of heads of state about science and technology in 1980. Uh, what they call it Lagos Plan of Action. Now they did, but nothing happened until 2000, where I think uh, the African leaders came to grip with the idea that without, for economic development, you need science and technology. And that they have to be serious about both. That the need for a new program for economic development of Africa with STI at the center of it. This is called NEPAD. NEPAD, Plan of Action and Consolidated Plan of Action for Science and Technology, was developed with the help of all international community, without exception. And also, it needed the support of the countries themselves in a summit where we, UNESCO played an important role. I had the pleasure of attending this magnificent summit in the January 3rd to 2007. Uh, and we approved that plan of action. And then the international community also came to help these countries together. Not only UNESCO, but everybody this time decided, since the Africans are serious about it, let's give it a try. And I think the, for the first time, the donor community, the ODA was challenged, Korea was playing an important role, and other countries, DFID, 
uh, from the United Kingdom and others played an important role so that this plan come to action. And in some countries, more than others, of course. These are the work of UNESCO. You can see the number of countries UNESCO helped develop uh, action plans and roadmaps for, for science and technology development geared towards implementing NEPAD Consolidated Plan of Action on Science and Technology. And this can be all consulted in the UNESCO website. Scientific research grew with the support of, as I said, all the donor community. And we began to see different images from the images we saw in the 60s. Uh, you can go, people can see in Ethiopia, there is a big development in Ethiopia. You can go to Accra in Ghana. You can go to Rwanda and you will find completely different agriculture. You can find a lot of business work. This is the now we have 16 car manufacturers, including from Korea. It is, it's true, it's assembly uh, uh, industry. But to do that, you need a big amount of engineers and technicians. And this is what happened in the last 20 years in Africa. So STI has been very helpful for Africa. It's only the beginning, but people should not underestimate it. It's a big difference between the two images that I showed in the 60s and today. So I think, uh, thanks to support from Korea, and uh, Korea is, is going on. This Earlier this morning, I spoke to my brother, Yim, that maybe the Africans can also call on Korea to set up uh, innovation centers in Africa. Rather than training people here in this beautiful country, I think it will be more effective to train them where they are, and for the same money, you can train 10 times more. So this is just uh, an idea. I hope that it can be, uh, can be taken up. Now I, I have covered the majority of what I wanted to say, but there are two points I wanted to say here. The opportunities and challenges faking STI in the future. And I think the opportunities that you all know here, it is this uh, industrial revolution 4.0. I think people don't realize how important these developments, which are, you know, diffusing in our life without us noticing them. Considerable the change in our lifestyle, the Internet of Things, virtual reality, 3D printing, and the big data, and all this is so incredible that is changing the way we can produce and the way we do research uh, and so on. To the extent that it seems to me that Talking about a national innovation system becoming a little bit problematic. We always included in our notion of national innovation system, international cooperation, but not underestimating it. Now it is not a component. Now it is an integral part of every single part of the national innovation system. Academia, all the research is now done with close collaboration with each other. The, the, all science policies now are based on international cooperation. The, uh, I gave some statistics here for uh, uh, what I call it, the, uh, the this is the US of course, uh, the, the center was United States of America being the center of, now it is decentralized, definitely, and we all know that. And uh, uh, we, can, we can have a lot of, of figures here uh, that can demonstrate that we have now, in terms of scientific publications, it is incredible how much uh, uh, scientific research and publication is now co-authored internationally. The, there, is, there is absolutely no way to say this is a national business. Here, there is, these are the data I, I give you about uh, collaboration. So far, as far as uh, science and engineering, 20, 25% went now to, to uh, from 16 to 25, and you can see for astronomy it's more than 56, and uh, it is reaching 34% uh, uh, in geosciences and computer science and the like. So soon, I'm not, I'm not talking about the beginning, but soon there will be no way to say this is a national research. It will always be now an international course of research. The same will apply to industry. Design is done somewhere, production is done. Otherwise, you receive a, a, a link, you type it, and you print it at home, you have a product. What is national innovation system? I think STEPI 
is thinking about, uh, and I think I saw an article about expanding the borders of national innovation system to the extent that N itself maybe should be called networked innovation system. I don't think we can talk about national innovation system the way we used to talk, and this is something for the future, and I think STEPI scholars and researchers have a lot to do in, in, this, in this area. Now, uh, I think it's, it's clear from, from, from what I say. The challenge, uh, uh, we, we mentioned two, two, two challenges. The first one is SDGs, and I think, okay, but the biggest challenge for me is climate change. I think we STI community, all of us, for SDGs we have still 12, 12 years to go. But I tell you, we don't have 12 years to go for climate change. So the STI community must do everything to bend the curves. There are three curves that we should make sure we bend. This is the curve of temperature rising. In the last 35 years, the temperature rose more than the beginning of measurements in 1880 something. We need to bend the curve. Now, the reason for this is, of course, the concentration of carbon dioxide. Now, this has gone so far as it now exceeded the 400 part per million. In fact, in March last, it reached 408 part per million. We have to bend this curve. We must bend this curve. Now here, this is the fantastic uh, simulation by uh, NASA, which showed where in red you see the carbon uh, uh, dioxide in the atmosphere. I don't know whether it will uh, work, but this is an animation uh, for, for, for the existence of carbon dioxide in the space. There is no doubt that we need to bend the curve. There is the third curve we should bend, and this is the sea level rise. Eight inches in the last 50 years, 20 centimeters. Now, it's not only dangerous for coastal cities, which maybe countries can protect themselves, but it's dangerous for the coastal water aquifer. The seawater intrusion can make a big problem of uh, uh, and of course, not to mention island that might risk to find very difficult uh, livelihood in there. We must bend this curve. So three curves, the challenge for the Thai community is, is, is urgent and it can, cannot wait. And my conviction is, this is the, the, the showing though what will happen if you don't, but I think everybody knows. Now, I am convinced that we now have to you know, we are in the crossroad, I, I, I think. And we should use, we have to devise policies that are based on the international cooperation, but really this disruptive technology, we should use them to the effect that we can find measures to achieve SDGs, but turn the curves, bend the curves of climate change. My guts, feeling, and belief that the coming generation might be the last generation that can do something about it. Because after 30 years from now, it will be very difficult to bend the curves. We, coming from the airport, here I saw the number of cars in the streets. And it's the same you find it in China, it's the same you find it in America, all over the places. Of course, there are some uh, creative economy things going here, and we have solar cars. Now, we reached last uh, year, one million electric cars, that is maybe good, renewable energies and other sources, but we have no way to avoid it. So the, uh, I think we need, for this to happen, we need peace in the world. We need uh, to, to, to allow scientific collaboration to grow. And what you have been doing in the last weeks here, and I hope in the 12th of June, the summit between the two, uh, North Korea and America, will materialize so that peace can come to this part of the world, which will be good for Korea, both North and South. It will be good for the world, but definitely it will be very good for STI International Cooperation. I thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for the inspiring speech, Dr. Yeltayeb.
May I invite the next keynote speaker, Dr. Hong Ju Ham, the Deputy Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, who will speak about science and technology innovation for the Sustainable Development Goals. Please welcome into the stage with a big round of applause. I represent the United Nations and I come from the United Nations Economic Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. UNSCAP is a parliament for Asia and we just completed our commission last week. Ministers from 58 Asia Pacific member states comes and discuss issues that are common to the Asia Pacific region. We provide in-country training, usually for developing countries. We provide research, we do research, and of course, we provide an intergovernment platform for discussion. With me is Mr. Jonathan Wong. He is the head of our STI unit that engages in science, technology, and innovation research, as well as a committee on STI that governments attend. So I thank Dr. Mustafa. I'm going to take off where he left off and show you the curve we all know. But I show you from a slightly different angle. I am not a scientist. I'm an economist. This is a very well-known curve. Economic growth has been very rapid post-industrial revitalization. This curve shows the carbon dioxide. Again, a very similar curve, a similar upturn. I'm not saying there's a causality, but there is clearly a correlation. Science, technology, and innovation is affecting our planet. We benefit from modern society, comforts, cars, planes, but we also create damage which we did not know when we were applying it, but we certainly know now. It's strange how the richest of the rich now, 1% of the population globally, owns 20% of the global GDP. The world's 80 richest people have 50% of the wealth equivalent of the world. It's strange, again, causality, not causality, co correlation, that the rich guys all come about, many multi-billionaires are in the tech world. Inequality, inequality of income, inequality of opportunity, inequality of technology. So, I continue to note that when it's not just individuals, it's actually countries. Korea happens to be amongst the STI leaders, but we are very few in Asia. There's only eight, actually. And many, many, many countries are outside the realm of the STI zone. That's a reality. The digital divide, which was the ICT divide, is now a technological divide if you don't have that base technology of ICT, you will never catch up on the frontier technologies of AI, robotics, et cetera, et cetera. The digital divide has not closed since the introduction of the internet. The technological divide is pushing developing countries even further back. So what are these SDGs? I think everybody knows what the SDGs are. I don't want to explain. But I do want to explain what STI is in the role of SDGs. Specific indicators, as Dr. Mustafa mentioned, deal with science, technology, and innovation. But STI is actually what we call a means of implementation. It is a common factor that is derived to push and achieve the SDG goals. In fact, any single one of them, STI, is part of. This concept of a means of implementation is exactly, I, I, I apologize, I am an economist, but 
as we learned in school, technology is what shifts the aggregate supply curve. And it creates massive output growth, not even causing inflation. That is what we wrote in the 20th century. I would even say parts of the 19th century. But what we are finding is this aggregate sh supply shift has to be compensated with government expenditure, R&D, whatever it may be, to offset the negative effects of STI. It's an aggregate demand reaction to the aggregate supply shift. That is all in the interest of the three main pillars of SDG, the economic, the social, and the environment. What we have seen very clearly is that technology can advance economic growth and advance it a lot. We're talking double-digit growth, economic growth that we've seen. At the same time, it causes social disruptions. I showed you one graph that showed you the ultra-rich and many in society being left behind. But the environmental impact is enormous and massive. Uh, whether it's plastics in the ocean, temperature, sea rise, the list goes on. And it starts with the dust we have in Seoul. It starts with the bad air we have in Dhaka, Beijing, and New Delhi throughout the world. Asia Pacific has the dubiable honor of performing extremely poorly on the environmental SDGs. We've done pretty well on the economic, in fact, we've done surprisingly well on social, but environment, we've done really very poorly. So SDG really is a means of implementation to make it work, but we take it with caution. Dr. Mustafa presented the fourth industrial revolution, whether it's the frontier technologies, AI, robotics, what we have, but again, these frontier technologies, I say, must be used not only to advance economic growth, but to take care of social issues and to, most of all, address environmental concerns. Technology must be used to address the concerns that we face in the 21st century, and I couldn't agree with Dr. Mustafa more. This takes money. And it takes a lot of money. The SDGs is not an easy job. And can we do it by 2030? As a UN official, I say, yes, we can. Personally, I have serious doubts. It's going to be a tough one. Just look at the total amount, and this is basic arithmetics we're using, of the financing needed globally. And we're not talking millions. We're not even talking billions, we're talking trillions of dollars. It's astronomical. It is unfinanceable. So when you look at finance, and today we're going to talk about Korea's ODA, most of the money in the world today, in terms of financial flows, is from the private sector. SDGs has to be adopted by the private sector. But that's a very easy thing to say. Uh, when you're building satellites, you're not thinking about trees. Or when you're building canals, you're focused on canals. It's not a holistic approach when you say the private sector. But look at where we are with ODA. Always flat, increasing because we have other countries joining, like Korea, like other newly rich countries. But overall, the world of money lies above the black line of governmental support. This is a ranking of OECD countries and their aid effectiveness. 27 countries chosen, 27 OECD members. Korea ranks last. I'm not doing this to show Korea needs to do better or not. That's not the point. And nor should we be ashamed because we're very new to this game. Well, these other guys have been doing it for years and years. Even Japan has been doing it for years and years, and we're right next to them. 
I urge you to look at this analysis by the Center for Global Development based in London that manages and analyzes, analyzes aid effectiveness. It looks not just at the amount of aid we give, but the policy environment that the country provides. If you give aid but you close your country to trade, that is imports from developing countries, how good a donor are you? That's what this picture looks at. I want to highlight aid where we are last and technology where we are first. Korean aid, ODA, already has a lot of technology component. Not only that, the developing world sees Korean ODA, has great interest of Korean ODA that has technological components. Technology has now defined Korea. And it's because Korea, we always talk about how poor we were in the 50s and 60s. We had the Semaorundong that really moved us from agriculture to manufacturing. But the second huge leap actually occurred in the 80s where we moved from manufacturing to services. But in 2000, we jumped from a manufacturing service oriented economy to a knowledge economy. And science and technology became the underlying factor of that jump. That's why Korea is viewed as such a technology, technological country, but an innovative country. And when you look at our aid, the best ones actually have technological components. So I apologize, but I stole this slide from uh, Koika's presentation on OEA. Uh, that will be presented later this afternoon. Three distinct components. Direct STI support. Where is that? Helping countries with their STI policies and structures working with the private sector. I like these three pillars. Korea's direct approach to STI is fascinating. STI, ICT, is almost apparent and relevant in everything we do nowadays. So I have lived abroad for almost all my life, and whenever I come to Korea, I come to see my doctor, I'm amazed at the e-health registration system. They send me an SMS telling me, in 10 minutes, your doctor will see you. We presented that to Croatia. Croatia, an EU member state, has free medical services. It's a really fine doctor. But because it's free, people wait, not hours, months for a specialist. They don't give emails to tell them when they're going to see it. And they were fascinated by this. E-governments, the way we pay our taxes through the internet, the way we order food through the internet. There are cities or countries in the South Pacific that have islands that is more removed than North Korea to South Korea. How do you create an educational program? And you've got to look at countries like the Faroe Islands that uses internet to teach almost a uniform educational platform. These, as I'm saying, are social issues that we are addressing using STI as a means of implementation to deliver results. These are the type of examples that really makes Korean ODA attractive. When we provide knowledge on, as he said, network STI policies or national STI policies or sub-regional STI policies, I think STEPI and the Korean government, KAIST, etc., can really provide quite a lot of input where I think Korea has the greatest advantage is working with the private sector. And here, Korean corporations and technology and innovation needs to move together. We are no longer a country that can compete on low prices. There's no way, whether it's ODA or private-private competition, 
to compete against countries like China and now pretty much all of Southeast Asia. They all know how to make roads. We all know how to put on railway tracks. But what can Korea bring that's different? And the answer is always technology. Roads today are not like the roads. The roads of tomorrow are nothing like the roads we have now. Already we have seen a revolution of cars talking with cars. Cars talking and looking at the roads. Lane changing, parking assistance. We are not far from a future where the roads will talk back. That's why we have co-deployment of roads with fiber optics and the roads themselves. Eventually, we won't need light signals. The signals will be in the car itself. If the road is able to talk to the car. That's an example. Infrastructure itself is changing to become smart. Whether it's green ports, whether it's airports, whether it's rails, or whether it's water and sanitation systems. This technological component embedded in a road construction project is what will distinguish countries and is not distinguish Korean assistance, blended finance, ODA together with private sector financing can make it cheap, but what I'm saying is it makes it effective. And this is Korea's number one perception in the world. There are many ways that you can work with the private sector. And one of the best things that we have found is blended finance. One million in ODA, given as one million in ODA, yields about one million dollars in results. But one million dollars in ODA with $10 million in private sector assistance lowers the interest rate substantially when you have a grant, a LIBOR plus 7% interest rate loan goes down to about 2, 1% with just one-tenth grant. But that's not the more interesting part. For me, the more interesting part is with $1 million grant, the same five-year ODA has an extension of tenor. The maturity can increase to 15 years. When you can do that, you can finance big infrastructure projects. So this blended financing approach is really something that technology allows you to do. The new realm of today is called innovative financing, whether it's fintech, whether it's social enterprises. These technology applied lending mechanisms is allowing us to reach directly to the end users and is allowing us to drastically reduce costs. ODA needs to jump on this process of creating technology in ODA itself. And if you look at all the documents that the government produces on Korea's ODA, there is never a vision of where to take the ODA. So, my biggest comment, and if I can only leave one message to you today, is the nature of Korea's ODA. It's too output-driven, not outcome-driven. What I mean is, there is really no need to build a hospital in Afghanistan if you don't have any doctors. There is no need to build a school in Bang in Thailand when there's no teachers. And there is certainly no need to build a superhighway if it doesn't link communities. Our output, and look at any Korean document, is all about how many kilometers of road we built, schools, hospitals, what is the actual amount per country that we give. I have yet to see anything that says why the road was built. Building the road was the output but the outcome is to connect people. The outcome is to facilitate trade. The outcome is to allow for the movement of services. That, to me, is a much more important measure. It is not whether you built a hospital, but how many patients have been cared for? How many people have been recuperated? It is not the school 
but how many girls you've educated, how many, how you increase primary school education. Those are outcomes. ESCAP is now working on a woman's innovative financing mechanism where we're trying to bring fintech and different types of financing for women entrepreneurs. We're not concerned about the bond that was issued. That's an output. We're concerned about how much that money raised from the bond issuance can be used to support women entrepreneurs. That's the first order outcome. But actually, we're not just interested in that. We're interested in second and third order. So the reason why we support women entrepreneurs is because when you support one woman entrepreneur, you always systematically support her family. Not only that, you support her greater family, and usually her community. So a loan to a woman entrepreneur that is singular has an outcome that affects an entire community. That's what we have to measure. And Korean ODA does that relatively poorly. That's why we rank number 27 under A. So when you look at the Nordic countries that are high on this list, and when you deal with donor countries, our discussions evolve around results, outcomes. In fact, the biggest challenge we face is writing a results framework. How do I know I'm going to affect 25,000 women? I'm guessing. It's aspirational. I hope I hit 500,000. When you start focusing on aid in that manner, when you bring technology into a road construction, whether it's ITS, Intelligent Transport System, whether it's Metropolitan Traffic Management System, what I want to know is, introducing this technology, how much have we helped the public? the people of that city. What is the commute time? How much has it reduced by introducing a traffic management system? By introducing ITS, the biggest thing for me is, and in Asia Pacific, we also have the dubious honor of having the most people die from road accidents. Thailand, where I live, is a country that is the best at it. <laughs> ITS can indeed be used as a road safety outcome, if that's the way you want to design it. <coughs> so, as I see, the greatest challenge for Korean ODA is not only increasing it to an OECD level of 0.7% of GDP, that's an output. We should give more. We have an obligation to give more. And if you can't give it to a country, give it to a multilateral so that you can actually have and see the outcomes of your aid. We clearly have to have more aid that has a science, technology, and innovation component because that is what Korea brings as a comparative advantage. It's not just that we have it, they want it. And the example of Ethiopia that's talking about launching a satellite, that's talking about STI as a driving force. Why wouldn't you? Why do you have to go as a developing country to start getting landlines and putting all these telephone wires in your ground when you can just jump straight to mobile technology and mobile phones? Why would you go through that step if you can bypass it? And we're seeing that occurring in many countries. That's the role that Korea should play, helping developing countries move from their development status to the 21st century. They don't have to copy the Korean model. And the Korean model is extremely difficult to copy. They should take what worked best and apply it in their context. And we should figure out how to help them in their context not on the Han River. In SCAP, we would love to work with Stepping. 
We think STEPI is indeed a premier think tank. It is quite a, a, a think tank that focuses on STI, and that's rare. The good part of it is it's not theoretic research. It's applied research, which makes it much more relevant for us. We think the research, co-research opportunities are high because of what SDI can deliver for development, because of what SDI can deliver for the SDG agenda. And we would like to work much, much more with the private sector. And SDI lends itself to the private sector. STI is rarely a government. We talked quite a little bit about missile technology and missile projectile accuracy beyond missiles. The technology world, science, innovation, is by and large a private sector phenomenon. So if you look at countries that are world leaders of STI, they usually send, spend 2 to 3% of GDP on STI. Of the countries that do spend close to two, one and a half percent, the only countries that really succeed, Korea being one, is when of the two percent, more than two thirds are by private sector, one third by the public sector. If that's occurring in the private sector, it is a duty to start working with the private sector and delivering the STI results as a private sector has achieved to our developing member recipient countries. Packaging it just right is what we need to spend much, much more time thinking. So in the world of development, this is not an engineering science type adventure. It's a slow process. And you spend much, you should spend much, much more time designing your project, implementing your project to ensure you get the results. Quick disbursement, quick achievement, quick production usually never achieves the results but a hollow and very good looking hospital. We're delighted to work with, uh, with uh, the Korean government with COICA, with KECF. We have a woman's bond, uh, uh, a woman's entrepreneur support mechanisms where we would like to work with the government to blend finance so we can give more money to many, many more women entrepreneurs. We'd like to use FinTech, and Korea is one of the leading countries on FinTech applications. Bring that to the Pacific where they ha are not even banked. Bank the unbank, but always focus on the woman. I'm afraid there's far more men here than women, because they are a much better bet. That is a historic fact. I thank everybody, and uh, I really am very honored that, that you invited me to speak. Thank you very much, Dr. Ham.